Uh, my name is Samir Bamra and I'm a theatre director. Uh, I'm the artistic director of physical productions. And you were not born in the UK, were you? I was born in Kenya uh, many years ago and I lived in Kenya till I was 14. Uh, and then we moved to the UK. And what made you get into theatre? Uh, I, oh, I've always enjoyed performing. In fact, when I was in Kenya, I took part in a lot of school uh, school productions. I also trained in dance. Um, and when I moved to the UK, uh, I continued with um, Amdram societies and, and uh, theatre studies as a course. Um, but I mainly focused uh, on what was my professional career at that time as a designer. Uh, and I think it got to a stage where I went to see a bad theatre production uh, made for Asian audiences. Uh, but because they couldn't pronounce some of the words correctly, it infuriated me and I felt that I could do better. So I decided to start a very long, challenging journey into learning the craft properly uh, and making work that I do now. So where was this performance? Uh, if I mention it, then I think the people will find out and they will throw stones at me. <laughs> but it was in the UK? It was in the UK, in a West End theatre. In the West End? Mm. I see. Or is it off West End? One of the two. <laughs> and so were you particularly drawn to South Asian theatre as a result? I think that um, I'm very much influenced by South Asian culture. Uh, I think our culture is very rich and beautiful. Uh, and uh, what I really should have said earlier, actually, is that I'm mixed faith. So both my parents have different religions. And with that comes a myriad of um, cultures, rituals, traditions, uh, and because their friends network was equally diverse, I got to learn a lot about their cultures and rituals. Um, so as an individual, my parents brought me up to be someone who's not only respectful of other cultures and religions, but also aware of them and interested in them. Uh, and because of those, this beauty, this richness that we have, uh, I feel that it always inadvertently um, excites me and becomes a, an influence in the work that I want to make. So may I ask you what these two different religions were? Uh, my mum's Sikh uh, and my dad's Muslim. And was it reflective of um, a culture in Kenya of mixed? Um, well, it was a forbidden uh, relationship. Uh, <laughs> that I mean, I think it's there's a line in Bennett like Beckham that says, um, if you marry a Muslim, you get killed. <laughs> if you're a Sikh girl who marries a Muslim, you get killed. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the situation was very much the same for my parents, uh, you know, uh, but they didn't let that affect how we were brought up. Uh, and we had two religions essentially living in our household. Uh, without issues uh, and you know a lot of people say well you have to make a choice uh, well my choice really is that I love the world that I live in and everything that comes in the world so I must rather be one of those people and then try to bring that joy that I get into my work so that other people can also be influenced by it uh, and learn that it's a beautiful place that we live in and it's about the human connections we make that makes a good visceral performance uh, and makes us realize how thankful we are uh, to be alive. So having been born in Kenya, brought up there for 14 years and coming to, the in, uh, to England, that must have a profound influence in kind of the relationships that you gathered around you. Uh, I guess so. I mean, I was very different when I moved here to most Asian children. Um, what I noticed at the school that I went to is that the Asians hang around with each other uh, and the non-Asians hang around in their own groups. And here I was in the middle, neither that side nor the other side. Um, and, 
you know, there, there was some tension around that. Uh, I was bullied uh, by Asians. Um, in fact, I had stones thrown at me. Uh, one day, as I was walking from the uh, city centre in, in a little village called Nelson, uh, some group of 14, 15 boys um, threw stones at me saying that I'm a kafir. Kafir means um, a non-believer of Islam or something. Uh, and as far as I was concerned, I was like, well, you're not really exactly very good um, followers of Islam than are you <laughs> um, if you're there judging someone. Um, anyway, this religion, this conversation talking about religion, whereas uh, uh, I think that my experience was one where I could be part of both and be part of neither. So, I li and I quite like that. I quite like being in the circle and also outside the circle. Uh, again, coming back to that question of choice, uh, I can move in and out of both uh, quite easily, and I quite like that fluidity. So that must have shaped your artistic journey incredibly. It does. I mean, if you watch my current production, Cymbeline, uh, Cymbeline is very personal to my life. Um, it looks at mixed faith marriages. Uh, it looks at respecting each other's religions. Um, there is a scene in the play where the female character, uh, Inajan, is uh, rumoured to be dead and um, her husband takes her ashes. Inajan's playing a Hindu character, uh, uh, is in a Hindu character, and her husband, Shiruddin, is a Muslim. So he takes her ashes and he scatters them, as were, would be the Hindu ritual rites uh, in a funeral. So I, I, I like to, to, do, to, to introduce that duality because it's about paying respect to this person who you love um, in my work. And I brought that in, in, in what is essentially a very British piece of literature um, because I felt that it connects really well. Uh, and certainly in the world that we currently live in, which is, which is getting more and more mixed, um, I think that's the beauty of being able to bring what I have grown up in, in that world that I've grown up in. I think there's a beauty in that, and to be able to share that now, I think it's, and it's quite important. I think that makes, this is what makes my work very distinct to other British artists. But they all have a South Asian aesthetic, don't they? Absolutely, I, I would never get rid of um, the South Asian colours and the, the costume and uh, uh, the drama and the spectacle that it brings. Uh, you know, the sari is one of the most beautiful, beautiful uh, pieces of clothing that can be worn in so many different ways. And I think that my work always has to have a sari somewhere in there. <laughs> um, but you know, you've got lots of other influences. So, you know, in Ajahn, in the wedding sequence, even though, as I mentioned earlier, she's playing a, her character is of that of a Hindu woman. She's wearing what is a very Muslim wedding outfit. She's wearing a sharara. Um, and her husband's wearing something that would be more appropriate to a more Indo-Western uh, culture. So I, I, it's a, I love blurring the boundaries uh, and and costume and aesthetic, Indian aesthetics or Asian aesthetics, um, just bring such a difference to the work that I, I make. You've blurred the boundaries of quite a few well-known plays that you've reimagined, haven't you? Yes, yes. Um, I, I've reimagined uh, the French play uh, uh, The Maids by uh, Jean Genet, uh, and I set it in the 18th century India when um, very, few, very few people know about it, but the French were in India uh, at that time and they brought in some of their, um, uh, some of the things that they were very famous for, the B-Day, for example. Um, and th these w were introduced to India around that time, so it was beautiful to be able to do that, play this idea of being French madames, but also very Indian aesthetics. Um, and similarly, I've done other Shakespeare's before as well. Uh, I've done uh, an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. 
and I fused it with Layla Majnu, the, the, a story, uh, a Persian story by Hasmat Shah, uh, and another Shakespeare, uh, Twelfth Night, uh, which we renamed What You Fancy. Uh, we'd completely adapted them, uh, reimagined them in new contemporary language as well. Uh, but Cymbeline remains true to its uh, original form in its original language. So how would you say that the stories of these plays um, connect with South Asian stories? They connect in my mind. Uh, when I read something, uh, I automatically visualize something else. Uh, and it's again these influences that I've been brought up with. Um, so when I was reading Cymbeline, I could see textures of the Mahabharata in it, and I could see colors from the Ramayana in it, mm. two very different mythological pieces of work, uh, some, relig some say religious as well, um, but they give us a code of living. Uh, and I could, I could see the stories from it, you know, the, the idea of the, the, the bet, the wager in, in, in the Mahabharata that results in the, in the, in the, in the five princes attacking uh, to reclaim their kingdom back uh, is very much evident in Cymbeline. Uh, similarly, uh, the idea of um, being in a forest, banished into a forest, uh, one of the characters reminds me of Sita. Uh, it's a male character, but he reminds me of Sita and when she was banished by Ram. Um, and I, I just, you know, when I see that, I, I can't help but work with that um, because this just makes it so much more relevant to the audience that I'm trying to reach, uh, who wouldn't come and see a Shakespeare, who would never have known that actually that aspect of Shakespeare reminds me of this uh, and therefore is relevant to you. These are universal stories. Uh, the, the stories in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana are also universal stories. They are just beautiful in how they connect and make us realize that we're all very similar to each other. And it's that similarity that I want to bring in my, uh, to show in my work. So are you very aware of your audiences at all times? Absolutely. You know, I, I know that the people who come to watch my work will be very diverse. Uh, they'll come from very different backgrounds. So Cymbeline, for example, attracts the Shakespeare lover who is interested in seeing something that's not Shakespeare in a way he's always seen it, that end on Stanislavski style of performance. They're not, they're not coming to see that. They're coming to see something that's new interpretation, something that brings out a new color, a, a new sound, uh, and a new visual aesthetic. Um, and then the Asian audiences are coming to see the, the ingredients that make a Bollywood film, you know, the, the fantastic costumes, the drama, the melodrama, the music, the dance. Um, and, and then when you bring the two together, you see how each one enjoys it in a very different way. Because the humour that an Asian audience might get will be very different to the humour that the uh, non-Asian audience will pick up. And that's just beautiful, because then they're always wondering, why are you laughing at this? Well, you know, I want to know what reference point this is. So I, you know, I took a reference point from the film, a popular film called Dabang, where um, Salman Khan takes off his sunglasses and he, he takes them off, and I'm going to just show this over here. He puts them over here like this, so they're on his back, and he's playing cool. Um, so I took the Mickey out of that in the show because I thought I'm going to give that to a character that isn't very cool and he's going to do that because he thinks that's cool um, because it's not very cool really <laughs> um, so yeah you know I, I like to bring those influences in because it connects people to different things so do you have songs and dances as simply we have a opening song that is sung and and there's a little movement in there um, the two actors sing it, uh, and uh, they've just done a wonderful job. Their voices are beautiful. Uh, and then we have a, uh, an Arabic dance number as well in the piece as well. Uh, I wish I could have. A, I've, I, I wish I could have put more song and dance in it. 
but uh, there's only a limited scope for it. So we've used the two songs that Shakespeare has written in it, and we've added two more. I think six would have been great, but four is enough. And how have you noticed your work has evolved over the, over the years? Uh, I think I've learned to articulate what it is that I want to do better. Uh, I've also learned that the work that I want to make must touch the human emotion. If it doesn't, if it's, if it's not something that is important to me, there's no point in me sitting in a rehearsal room for six weeks uh, for, in the first instance to try to teach people what it is that I want you to get and then sit through two or three weeks of it in tech rehearsal, previews, opening night shows, etc. Uh, to sit through that performance again and again. There's no point in enduring all of that pain if it's not something that means something to me. So I've got to feel passionate about the story that I want to tell. Uh, and if I feel that I'm passionate enough, then I think the audiences will get it and they will connect with it because I've been very true in what is it that I want to do. So do your family get it, what you're doing? Uh, my dad's never seen any of my work uh, and my mum's only seen one show of mine before she passed away. So, no. <laughs> um, uh, yes and no, I guess the answer is to that. I think that uh, my family isn't necessarily just my parents and my sister and, uh, and my immediate family. Uh, but there are also that family of friends who are very close to my life uh, and whose opinion also equally matters because they can be so brutal. You know, there's no one worse than a 16-year-old who you've said, you know, you're going to be my sister. I'm going to look after you like an older brother uh, and you're my adopted sister. You've no idea how brutally honest they can be. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that they are... They're very truthful in what they think of my work. Uh, and I think that they've spotted that it's, it's certainly on an upward journey. Um, but, and that's the way it should be, you know. I, I always want to grow and make my work better and stronger and bigger. Uh, and that comes with time and with practice. When did you form physical? I formed physical, well, the name physical, when I actually formed physical, I, I have no idea. Um, but the name physical, I, I know when I thought of it. And that was on the 3rd of August, 2003. Um, I'd spent about a year and a half thinking of a name. Uh, and we were walking past some pub in Leicester. We'd just moved to Leicester. It'd been nine months we'd been in Leicester. And... Um, we were just exhausted of trying to think of this name for this new company that we wanted to set up. We walked past the, this pub called The Fix. The Fix was spelled P-H-I-X-X. -X. And I thought, you know what, that's an amazing spelling. I like that. How about physical spelt wrong? <laughs> and let's spell it P-H-I-Z-Z-I-C-A-L because that just sounds like fizzy and poppy and, and just dynamic and, and, and colourful and fun. So that's what we called physical. And that's when we thought of the name. The company itself was, I think, as a limited company, we were incorporated in 2005. Uh, but I, I, I think that our actual birthday really is when our first show opened. Because you seem to be a very reflective person, very quiet. Uh, the name seems to be like a completely different side of you. <laughs> uh, I do, do take my time to reflect on what's gone on before me um, and use that to, in what comes ahead of me, uh, at least in the work that I want to make. Cymbeline is the prime example of something that's a reflection of my past, um, but something that I've done in my present. So which of your, um, your works are you sort of most connected with that you feel like, perhaps proudest about? Uh, I can never forget my first show, uh, Precious Bazaar, um, because it taught me a lot. We made a lot of mistakes, but what we actually have is people to this day remembering this show and actually telling me they really enjoyed it. I think that's so funny because Personally, I think that it was a terrible show, really bad. Um, 
but we had a lot of confidence. And we did a really bad show with so much confidence that the audiences just loved it. I thought we were very stupid and naive, and audiences were also equally, I guess, stupid and naive at that time, I don't know. <laughs> um, but as a, as a company, it's something that brought um, the very values that, are, that physical is formed on, uh, and this idea of a family. Uh, we work as a family. Uh, it's very important for me, even coming to 10 years on to Cymbeline, that uh, the company work as a family. Uh, it's very, that's just really important. Um, and it's not an old trick, really. You know, the RSC believe in the idea of the ensemble. So it's not something that I'm doing that's uh, new. Uh, it's just, why, why spoil something when it works, you know? So have you worked with certain people for the whole 10 years? I've worked with a range of people, yes. Some, I think in every show that I've worked with, there's always been someone who's worked in a previous show. And that will always remain, uh, unless they refuse to work with me. Unless they all refuse to work with me. I'm sure one of them will say yes, any year. <laughs> uh, no, I think that it's good because the, that, that those actors bring in um, the values that they have grown up with. And they introduce those values to the new actors so that it's not... A, a strange working environment because you know when you start working with a company on the first week of rehearsals you don't know who the director really is you have to work out what the politics and the dynamics of working are um, but I don't I try to break those away by having that model in place uh, and also as a, as a director I'm very collaborative in the work that I do it's really important for me that the actor who I'm working with understands and has their own perspective of what it is that this work is about and then also understands what I'm trying to get them to do and what my influences are because what I've grown up with isn't the same as what you've grown up with mm. and when you bring the things that you have grown up with to my table that's beautiful because I grew up with that then and I take something of yours and I put it into mine and that's very important that is just the fundamentals of the way I work. So is there anything in particular you want to share with us? So, you know, if you've given us a very lovely idea of your work, you know, and the range of it, and how that's been informed, is there something we can look forward to apart from Zimbabwean? In the future? Mm. Um, well, there is a dream project that I have, uh, and it's, I've, you know, I thought of the idea in 2005. Um, I'm hoping that it doesn't take me 10 years to make it. <laughs> um, it came about a w in a workshop with the BBC Films uh, at that time. And it's taken time to get the permissions for it and get the approval of the person whose biography I'm basing it on. Um, it, it's a play called Big B the Musical. It's based on a particular incident in this amazing, famous actor's life that transformed how the world saw him. Um, and it transformed him as well. I think that's something that I'm very keen on making. And uh, thankfully, I have his blessing to do that. Uh, so it's just a case of making sure we have all the resources and the creative team in place to be able to do that. And also, uh, you know, it's a big show. It needs to have a good tour. So th that's something that I'm definitely holding very close to my chest. Uh, but in terms of work, there's always work going on, whether I'm making my own work or whether I'm producing for someone else. Uh, it excite both sides excite me just as much. Um, if I'm making work, it takes a, a long time for me to put it on stage. Uh, I need to spend time to fester and digest and think about what it is that I want to do. I want to scrap things and I want to bring new ideas on board and I want to test them and if they don't work they need to go as well um, but um, uh, and that I think that takes time you know it takes time resources uh, and imagination which doesn't happen just like that sometimes you walk into it sometimes you have to dream it uh, sometimes you just have to 
be in that rehearsal room fighting to get it out, really fighting to get it out. Well, best of luck. Thank you.